time is almost finished. It's time to be done with the abominations. How much Holy Spirit have we? Let us make a change. We have to apply the word of truth to our lives. It's time that there is a change made. Victory will attend the third angel's message. Let us speak of spiritual things to one another. Choose Christ today. Are you pleasing God? Or are you busy pleasing man? Who are you working for? The night cometh when no man can work. God is not giving us a new message. We are to proclaim the old message that brought us out of the churches in 1843 and 1844. That message is what I've shared with you today and I will write upon him my new name. We want that new name because that name is the seal of God placed upon those who like Enoch would rather die than sin. Join me in that striving work be like Enoch. Don't be afraid of their faces. Step forward. Let's finish this work and go home at last to heaven. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for a beautiful Sabbath day that you have given again. As the seasons change, we see the, the leaves falling, and yet, as we see the changes and, and the events, we see the beauty that you have preserved even in those things for us. As we come to you this morning, we want to be able to see the beauty in your word, to see it clearly as we have not seen before. We pray for the Holy Spirit to be our help and our teacher, that you will lead, bless, and guide. And I ask as well this morning that you will help the electronics to work as we record, as, as we present through the conference call. May these things work efficiently today. Bless us now and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So our study for this morning is about a subject that I've been contemplating actually for quite some time. And the title of our sermon is Murmuring, Fault Finding, and Evil Speaking Equals Self Destruction. Murmuring, Fault Finding, and Evil Speaking Equals Self Destruction. Let's go to our Bibles. John chapter 6. The book of John, chapter 6 and verse 43. John chapter 6 and verse 43. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. Murmur not among yourselves. So even Jesus among his chosen had issues with murmuring. 
and he gives this instruction, but this is not something that just began with the disciples. This is something that is an age-old problem. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 10 and ver um, verse 10. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now what is it talking about here? It's talking about the children of Israel and Moses. So let's go to that. Let's go to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. And we could spend a lot of time reading a lot of the story, but I think in this case a verse will be sufficient. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 8. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you an evening flesh to, in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full. For that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him, and what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So, Moses realized, number one point, that when we murmur against another, it's really against God. Point one. Point two, God gives us sometimes, when we murmur and complain, God gives us sometimes those things that we have been murmuring about or for, he, go ahead, he goes ahead and grants us those things. Whether it is what he sees best for us or not. Webster's 1828 Dictionary for the word murmur. Murmur, it's a verb. And it says, to make a low, continued noise like the hum of bees, a stream of water, rolling waves, or like the wind in a forest. And I thought, well, that doesn't fit very well. Let's go on to the next one. To grumble. Ah, now sounding like what we're, context we're talking about. To grumble, to complain, to utter complaints in a low, half-articulated voice. To utter sullen discontent with, at, before, the thing which is the cause of discontent. As, murmur not at sickness, or with, at, or against, before, the active agent which produces the evil. So, in other words, to put this in simple language, we are not to grumble and complain whether it be low mumblings or whether it be loud and boisterous. We are to not do these things. Let's go back to our Bible. Numbers. Numbers, chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14 and starting with verse 36. Numbers 14 starting with verse 36. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land. Even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. Now let's evaluate and look at this text. So Moses sends out some men to spy out or to search the land. And they came back and because of their report, they made the entire congregation to murmur, you might say the entire church, to murmur against Moses. By bringing 
up a slander by speaking evil, bringing a slander. And even those men did bring up the evil report. So murmuring oftentimes is a, tied to an evil report. But the last part of verse 37 died by the plague before the Lord. So where does murmuring take us? The whole congregation of Israel murmured how many made it through to be found faithful into that Canaan land. Only two of those to murmur. Today, God's people are a professed great congregation. And this congregation in many forms and ways is murmuring against one another, which of course is all really in reality against God. You see, we live in a time period literally represented in prophecy as the same time as the Israelites. We are waiting to go to that Canaan land, heaven. And what are we doing? But we're murmuring. We're murmuring at, against each other, which means that we are murmuring against God. The end result? Death. Not the land of promise, but death. So I believe from that there has to be a change. Let's go to Gospel Workers, 1892 edition, uh, page 159, paragraph 2, and on over onto page 160. Gospel Workers, 1892 edition, page 159. The travels of the children of Israel are faithfully described, the deliverance which the Lord wrought for them, their perfect organization and special order. Their sin, listen carefully, their sin in murmuring against Moses and thus against God, their transgressions, their rebellions, their punishments, their carcasses strewn in the wilderness because of their unwillingness to submit to God's wise arrangements. This faithful picture is hung up before us as a warning lest we follow their example of disobedience and fall like them. You understand that? Today, God's professed people are spending their time complaining and murmuring one to another, and they are not heeding the warning. This faithful picture is hung up before us as a warning, lest we follow their example of disobedience and fall like them. Going on with our quote. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters. Don't forget that word. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of the serpents. 
Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. What is that word? Why in the same paragraph does she say examples and then she says in samples? Well, there's two things. There's two points. One point is simply this. And that is that she's paraphrasing scripture here when she uses this word in samples. But beyond that, I want to give you the 1828 dictionary def definition of ensample and example. So to ensample as a verb, it means to exemplify, to show by example. Okay, and the word example means a pattern, a copy, a mode that that which is prospered or proposed to be uh, imitated. So an ensample is to exemplify or to show, to let it show out of our lives. So now let's go back and read this last part here. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples or to show and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him think, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 to 11. She was quoting, paraphrasing, but let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. These things are written to show us they're written for our admonition. It's not just a nice story of God leading a people through a wilderness and escaping from their slavery. There's examples here. Now let us go back to our quote. So I'm still quoting from uh, Gospel Workers, 1892 edition, page 160 now. Has God changed from a God of order? No. He is the same in the present dispensation as in the former. Paul says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. He, that is God, is as particular now as then. He designs that we should learn lessons of order and organization from the perfect order instituted in the days of Moses for the benefit of the children of Israel. Although Israel had a plain thus saith the Lord, they mourned, they wept, they murmured, they complained until the Lord was wroth with them. We need to lay aside all murmuring and do a thorough work in our own hearts. Because our, by our murmuring, our complaining about the circumstances that are about us, we are literally complaining that God doesn't know what he's doing. Why has he led us to here or to there? Or why has he done this and all of these things? Maybe we should learn to trust him. 
Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 281. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 281, paragraph 1. And I just have one sentence here of counsel for us. I saw that some do not realize that selfishness is at the bottom of their murmuring. Wow. Selfishness is at the bottom of their murmuring. So why do we murmur? It's because of self. It's because we are not allowing ourselves to submit to the molding and modeling of Christ, to the trials that are given us to perfect our characters. It's because we're selfish that we're murmuring and complaining. I believe that Christianity today, professed Christianity of today is in trouble. It is about to be overthrown just like the Israelites were overthrown during their testing time. So are you going to be that few number that makes it through? Or are you going to be among that number who is busy complaining? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to read some of what we've already looked at, but we're going to read it now in context and get a whole complete picture. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. So we're obviously clearly talking about the Israelites here. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that, f that followed them, that, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness." Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Another entire study, but if you look that out, we're talking about eating and drinking and sports, playing games. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Verse 8, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of the serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened un happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye, what I say. Flee from a idolatry. Today, 
We know that in Revelation 14, we know that the beast is represented of the papacy, but there is an image beast that is being set up. Now that beast is to worship the beast is idolatry. To worship the image beast is idolatry. What is the command that it is given here? Flee from idolatry. If we stay with those who are part of or worshiping the image beast today, we will receive of their reward. Revelation tells us that their reward is the plagues. Obviously, if you receive of the plagues, you will not receive of that heavenly Canaan. Flee from idolatry. What brought these people to this point? It was their murmuring, their complaining, and their self-pity that caused them to be brought down. And did you notice how one in the camp, or in the case of the spy sent out, how just a few talking uh, negatively about what they saw, how it affected the whole congregation. Don't think your words are not important. What you say to one person may be the means of their eternal life or their damnation. It may be the, the deciding factor as to whether they will have eternal life or not. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 290. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 290. Paragraph 2. God has shown me that He gives His people a bitter cup to drink, to purify and to cleanse them. They can make it still more bitter by murmuring, complaining, and repining. God has shown me that He gives His people a bitter cup to drink, to purify and to cleanse them. They can make it still more bitter by murmuring, complaining, and repining. So here we are. We're trucking down the road of life, and as we're trucking along in the road of life, along comes a trial. We stumble. So now we begin to complain because we stumble, and we begin to fall. And as we begin murmuring and complaining and repining about how rough the road is and this way, we begin to then cause others that hear us to complain as well. When God placed those trials in our way to purify our character. And instead of allowing it to purify our character, to cleanse us, we complain about those cleanses. I believe that we have some work to do. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And verse 30. 
And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Do we realize what we are doing when we begin speaking, evil speaking, those things, complaining along the way about this problem and that problem? Do we realize what we're doing? We are grieving the Holy Spirit who is the one who seals us. We're grieving Him away. He cannot seal us if He is not with us. This is a life and death situation. Some might think that, oh, with a sermon title such as we started out here with uh, evil speaking and murmuring and whatnot, this is not an important subject. But I truly and honestly believe that if you are honest with yourself, you will have to admit that at least once in your life, and I would likely say, that it's probably been more than once. I know for myself I would have to say it has been many more times than once. But I believe we are all at fault here. We have murmured and complained. Let's go to Christ Object Lessons. Christ Object Lessons, page 337, paragraph 2. Christ Object Lessons, page 337, paragraph 2. No evil speaking, no frivolous talk, no fretful repining or impure suggestions will escape the lips of him who is following Christ. The Apostle Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. A corrupt communication does not mean only words that are vile. It means any expression contrary to holy principles and pure and undefiled religion. Now stop and think about that one for a moment. Corrupt communication is not just talking about bad language. It is talking about any expression contrary to the holy principles and pure undefiled religion. So what about all of these veggie swear words? Oh man. What man? What are we really speaking about when we make that phrase? Oh man. Are we talking about the man Jesus Christ? Any expression contrary to holy principles. Stop and think about that for a while. Anything. By evil speaking, we are in reality denying Jesus Christ. If we deny Him, we have turned our backs upon our own, only hope of salvation. The choice is ours. The question is, what will we do? Psalms chapter 34. Let's go to the book of Psalms. Chapter 34 and verse 13. Psalms 34 and verse 13. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Now, why is it that this is important? Why is it that it is important that we keep our tongue from evil and our lips from speaking guile? Now, Guile is literally another way of saying the same thing as murmuring and complaining and evil speaking. 
So why is this important? Well, I have shared with this, um, this what I'm going to read next to you. I've shared this many times, but maybe it will be seen in a little bit different light today. Watch your thoughts, for they become your words. So we begin thinking about something, and as we think about that, it sure bugs me the way so-and-so did, the, what Mark said Sabbath, that just really irritates me. So then what happens? The next sentence of this little quote. Choose your words, for they become your actions. So, watch your thoughts, for they become your words. Choose your words, for they become your actions. Understand your actions, for they become your habits. Study your habits, for they will become your character, and develop your character, for it will become your destiny. Do you see that if we murmur and complain, it all begins in the mind, as we were just looking at, and then as we have gone to, from, to speaking these things, and as we speak them, they become our actions, and as they become our actions, it becomes our habits, our character, and our final destiny. We are making our choice for heaven or hell. Daily, as we speak and as we act. Letter 74, letter 74, 1896, and the 23rd paragraph, so long letter. It says this, Purity in speech and true Christian courtesy should be constantly practiced. Let there be no encouragement of sin, no evil surmising or evil speaking. Now, I want to dwell on this one for a little bit. Let's first of all look at the word surmising, 1828 dictionary. Suspecting, imagining upon slight evidence. Okay, so let's come up with an example here. Let's say I tell you that I will be to your house um, on Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday afternoon comes and it goes. And I don't show. So now you begin to evil surmise. Well, he said he would. But he didn't. Mark doesn't keep his word. Then it goes from the next step. Well, you know, maybe he's over there. He said he was going to go to so-and-so's, and maybe he's just over there. He likes them better than he likes me. And the conversation and the thought thickens and deepens as this plot forms. And before long, these suspicions of evil surmising become reality and truth in our minds as to what is really going on. And instead of reaching out and questioning to find out what happened, maybe we discovered discover when we call and we find out why Mark didn't show up is because he was in a vehicle accident and he's struggling between life and death in a hospital. How foolish were our thoughts, our evil surmisings. Do you realize when we evil surmise, probably 98, 99% of the time we are wrong. And yet, it's so easy to do. Well, I know she was going to call. She said she was going to call, and she hasn't called. So, well, um, and we begin to build from there as to what is going on from our little bit of information that we have, and we build this huge thing
And then we take that and we go to our friend and we say, well, Mark said he was going to be here on Tuesday afternoon and he didn't show up because, you know, in reality, he really likes these other people better than us and he's showing partiality and we go on and on and we build these stories and we begin murmuring, complaining, gossiping, evil speaking instead of looking to see what the truth is. Friends, we need a change. We need an immediate change. Jesus is waiting for us to get our act together. And we're still out here doing everything but what we should be doing. Evil speaking. We're encouraging others to sin by that. by our evil surmising, by our evil speaking, by our fault finding, all of these things. We're literally becoming cannibals and we're eating each other alive instead of supporting, helping, encouraging one another to the kingdom. There must be a change. And the change can't just start with one person. It needs to be many, but if it doesn't start with one, it won't start with any. So what I'm saying is it has to start with each one of us. We can't say, oh, well, if Mrs. Jones would make a change. It would be so much easier if she didn't call me and continually complain and surmise about these other individuals. If she, if whoever Mrs. Jones called that's doing the complaining, if they would just go to her, or when she says and she begins doing this, say, excuse me, Mrs. Jones, we don't have time for that now in the, in the Christian walk. Let us speak of those things that will lift us to Christ. Let's leave off with the evil surmising, the evil speaking. Let us leave off with these things. Let's go now to Manuscript Release, Volume 18, page 9, paragraph 2 and 3. This is Manuscript 116. It was written in 1898. That's eight, 18, Manuscript Release, page 9. Starting in paragraph two, do not encourage any tempted soul to tell you the grievances of a brother or a friend. Right there is where this problem often starts. Do not encourage any tempted soul to tell you the grievances of a brother or a friend. Tell them that you do not want to hear their words of censure and evil speaking because your counselor has told you in his word that if you cease to stir up strife and become a peacemaker, you will be blessed. Tell them that this is the blessing you are craving. For Christ's sake, do not speak or think evil. May the Lord help us not only to read the Bible, but to practice its teachings. The human agent who is faithful in his work, who unites gentleness with his power, justice with his love, cares or causes rejoicing among the heavenly intelligences and glorifies God. Let us strive to earnestly let us strive earnestly to be good and to do good, and we shall receive the crown of life that fadeth not away. 
Now in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, it tells us, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Are you a peacemaker or are you a murmurer, complainer, evil speaker? I would say if you're honest, it's likely that there's more of us that are the evil speakers, evil surmisers um, that are murmuring and complaining than there is of those that are peacemakers. How can I say that? It's simple. How many Israelites were there and how many made it to the land of Canaan? When you look at those numbers, I think it's fairly safe for me to say and knowing that they are an example to us because we are likely to repeat the same thing and I believe that Christianity as a whole is repeating the same thing and that is why it is so fractioned and separated and destroyed. Of course the arch enemy, the devil, is behind us or behind all of this and behind us in a way that is destroying us and not allowing us to become peacemakers because he doesn't want us to be called the children of God. It's very simple. And yet, we're in a war and a battle. And unless we make a change, unless we choose to be overcomers at last, unless we choose to no longer do these things, but to bring ourselves up short when we begin murmuring and complaining. We might need to say when we begin to speak about these things that we ought not to be speaking and we suddenly realize that we stop in mid-sentence and we say, I'm not going there anymore, sorry, please forgive me, and change the subject. And don't just go on thinking it in your mind, because as we read, if you think it here, it'll come out here. We've got to make a change. Original testimony number four. Original testimony number four, page 34. Evil angels, angels crowded around them, that is the professed people of God, pressing their darkness upon them to shut out Jesus from their view that their eyes might be drawn to the darkness that surrounded them, and they distrust God. And next, so what happens first? Distrust in God. Next, they murmur against Him. So when we begin murmuring, it is because we've already distrusted God and His promises. That means we're calling God a liar. And they distrust God and next murmur against Him. Their only safety was in keeping their eyes directed upward. Angels were having the charge over the people of God, and as the poisonous atmosphere from these evil angels was pressed around these anxious ones, the angels which had charge over them were continually wafting their wings over them to scatter the thick darkness that surrounded them. Some, I saw, did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them. And it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left them and went to the aid of those earnest praying ones. Are you an earnest praying one or are you murmuring and complaining and griping and still expecting to get to heaven? The angels of God left those who are complaining, who are murmuring, who are evil speaking.
And another thought for you. If you are continually listening to one who is evil speaking about others, they will soon draw you down to where you join them. And then you will partake of their punishment as well. Because a companion of fools is destroyed. Go ye out and be separate is the command given us. Are we willing to separate from those who will continue and will con no matter what go on? Now I'm not saying the first time somebody murmurs you cast them off like an old dirty rag. No, we work and we plead with them that they need to come up higher. There has to be a change, and when they, after several admonitions, they continue to reject it because they like the way they are in. They like the evil surmising. They like the murmuring, the complaining, the grumbling. They like their way. Then we must separate. Back to our quote. I saw the angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their energies to resist those evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. So if we are or trying with all every ounce of our might to overcome the battle, as the angels, the righteous angels, leave those who are confirmed evil, wicked, they will come and join the battle to help protect us. I want more than just two angels. My guardian angel and my recording angel. I want many angels shielding not only me, but my family and for you as well. But it's your choice. struggling with all their energies to resist those evil angels. Are we struggling? Or are we just going along with the flow down the river? If we're going along with the flow, we're going the wrong way. And note here, as I read this statement, and I'll read it again in a moment, but it said they were trying to help themselves. In other words, we have a work to do ourselves. Yes, Jesus died for us, and it is through his sacrifice that we are saved. But if we just sit back and say, let it happen, we will be lost. We have a work to do. And that work is the purifying of our character. What is your choice? Struggling with all their energies to resist those evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But the angels left those who made no effort to help themselves. And I lost sight of them. She lost sight of those who were not struggling to go forward. They were not persevering. This is not an easy job that we have been given. But we've been given all the tools and everything necessary so that we can do the job, so that we can have the victory. But the job is going to be diligently hard, and we have to be diligent to it. We have to struggle and fight to gain that victory. Manuscript 33, 1887, paragraph 15. Manuscript 33, 1887, paragraph 15. As we go to this, before I begin sharing this reference with you, I want you to deeply think and evaluate 
yourself. She says, I went to the meeting. A goodly number were present. And I spoke from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. Quote, Ye are laborers together with God. The Lord gave me a very sharp testimony for the church, who had been murmuring and complaining and fault-finding. After speaking to them and faithfully telling them the result of all such work, which, by the way, is what we have just done this morning, I then had the front seats vacated and urged those who wish to change their course to be, la be laborers together with God for unity to be one with Christ and here before God to drop their envying and evil surmising and questioning and evil speaking to here make a solemn covenant with God by taking these vacant seats. I think the whole church were on their feet moving for the seats and other seats had to be vacated. Well, we don't have today an auditorium or a church where I can request that the seats be emptied so that those who choose to make a change can come forward. But we can choose to make a difference. We can choose to no longer stand with those who are persistent in the evil speaking, in the, all of those evils that we have just spoken about, the surmisings, etc the murmuring. And we can cease from those things ourselves. So first we cease from it ourselves and then we cease to be with those who continue in those things. Review and Herald, May 14, 1895. Review and Herald, May 14, 1895, paragraph 9. Through the acceptance of hearsay evidence, the enemy obtains great advantage in council and committee meetings. Those who would stand for the right if they knew what it was are led astray by the evil surmisings of others in whom they have confidence. I want to read this statement, this sentence, one more time. Those who would stand for the right if they knew what it was are led astray by the evil surmisings of others in whom they have confidence. So in other words, when we begin to evil surmise about another individual and we share it with a third party, what we are literally doing is then that third party over here, then begins to have doubts. And instead of them finding the truth and being led to the truth, they're led astray. And now that creates a problem because I now have made this third party over here, I have made their loss of eternal life my fault because of my evil surmising. And I will pay for the sins of that third party. That's what I just read. Let me read it again, in case you missed it. Those who would stand for the right if they knew. So this third party that would stand for the right if they knew what it was, but they don't because they've been having so many people evil surmising and putting gossip in their ears, 
those who would stand for the right if they knew what it was are led astray by the evil surmisings of others in whom they have confidence. And of course, they're led astray. And that means those that they have confidence in are then responsible for them being led astray. Going on with that quote, their prayers are thus hindered. Their faith is paralyzed and unkind thoughts, unholy suspicions alienate them from their brethren. Thus God is dishonored and souls are imperiled. What I've just said to you is very clearly detailed, written here. And it all started from that thought of murmuring, the evil surmising, becoming vocal to others. Our lips literally poisoning the souls of others. evil surmising, the destruction of those who possibly may have had eternal life. Now we've made ourselves responsible. This is a serious thing that we're talking about. The choice is ours. Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. You see, God's people will never be in unity unless we start with laying aside all of these things. We, if we do not lay aside the malice and the guile and the hypocrisies and the envies and the evil speakings and the murmurings and the complainings, we will never come into unity of faith. And yet when we look at the time of the disciples after Jesus' death, when they were in that upper room, what was going on? These things were laid aside. And the Holy Spirit came in with a mighty power. Professed Christianity is looking for this outpouring of the Holy Spirit as it is being called. And yet, they're still devouring one another as though they were cannibals. And it's not going to happen. Not with them, anyway. The Holy Spirit will come. Because there will be a few who will have overcome in these things. Let's go to ch um, chapter 3 and verse 10 of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, that they speak no guile. Let's now go over to Revelation. I want to go to Revelation 14. It's a very, very familiar verse. I believe with the majority, and if it's not familiar, you best start reading it over and over until it becomes familiar. Let's go to verse four, or chapter 14, starting at verse 3. Verse 1 actually gives us who is being spoken about here. I'm gonna, let's, let me read part of verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on, mount, on the mount Zion. And with him a hundred and forty and four thousand. Now down to verse three. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn 
that song, but to the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women or churches, according to prophecy, a woman is representative of a church, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These are redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, no evil speaking, no evil surmising, no murmuring. Back to our verse, for they are without fault before the throne of God. How interesting. You want to be a part of the 144,000 who it is who is alive to see Jesus come? Then, see, there's not a second group that's going to just make it through by the seat of their pants. It's either you're among this group of Revelation 14 here that's being spoken of, or you have previously gone to sleep in Jesus. One of the two. So when it comes down to this, and talking about this group, this 144,000, which I believe we have ample evidence to prove it is a literal number. By the way, 144,000 is a very large number when we're comparing it to how many entered the ark, eight, or how many left out of, fled out of Sodom, or how many actually got to go into the land of Canaan of the Israelites, two. We're talking about a large number. And yet, here, these individuals had no guile found in their mouth. As we contemplate these things, as we realize the importance of our words and how our words not only affect our character, but how they affect each other, other people that we are around. Whether we are at work, whether we are in the store, wherever we are at, whatever we are doing, there must be a change because God's true and faithful people will have no guile for they are without fault before the throne of God. Let's go to Bible Echo, December 1, 1892, paragraph 2. Bible Echo, December 1, 1892, paragraph 2. We each have a battle to fight with the fallen foe. We should begin the conflict in the light of the Bible, gaining victories over self, giving no place to the evil one. We should not sin against God by indulging sinful thoughts or speaking murmuring words. We should not let the enemy control our powers in the least, but throw all the weight of our influence on the side of Christ. We should not sin against God by indulging sinful thoughts or speaking murmuring words. I would like, I would like today to invite all of you at this point in time to choose to make a change in your life, I would like to invite you to stand stating that you are willing, 
that you are willing to seek the mind of the Holy Spirit and to pledge yourself by God's help to put away all murmurings, all fault finding, all complaining, and all evil speaking. To make a full and dedicated change. And as you stand before God, vowing to make that change, I want you to listen to one more reference that I have. Signs of the Times, October 12, 1891, paragraph 10. Signs of the Times, October 12, 1891, paragraph 10. There are those who have only a nominal faith. They draw nigh to God with their lips, while the heart is far from Him. But the true wrestler for the victory has a real living faith, which is implanted in the heart by the Holy Spirit, and it makes every difference in the world with his life and words and actions. He has an aim in life, a living purpose which shapes the character. This hope is not vague, it rests on a solid basis which is the truth. It braces the soul for trial and nerves it for duty, irrespective of inconveniences or inclination. A stubborn, willful spirit is not of Christ, but of Satan. Hence, it will not be cherished by him who has the mind of Christ. All impurity of thought will be overcome, and the mind will be trained to pure and holy thoughts. Backbiting and evil speaking will be put away. Jealousy and selfishness will be overcome, for they are satanic and not like Christ. Bitter are the fruits of self-indulgence, of unsanctified traits of character. There is no rest or happiness in a life of opposition to God. Let us kneel. Our dear Heavenly Father, you have seen those who have chosen to stand, to vow to you that there will be a change, and that change will begin with them, with each one of us. And as that change happens within us, I pray, Father, that as we will soon begin a new week, and even yet today, that from this moment forward, that you may bring clearly to our mind what we are doing, that we may arrest ourselves in our thoughts and in our murmurings and complainings and our evil speaking, so that we will no longer go in that way. There's many ways that we try to justify what we do. Help us to realize that self-justification doesn't meet up to the work of heaven. We pray, Father, that you will give us each one the strength, for we know that the devil will battle against us striving to keep us from keeping our vow with you. And we pray that you will grant us that strength, that you will send extra angels to each one who is committing not only their lives to you, but their voice, their speech, that they will no longer do these things. We want 
the Holy Spirit to be poured upon us. And we cannot until we come into unity of the faith. And where we start is by our speech, by our murmuring and complaining. May we change our ways is our prayer. And we direct all of these things to our Savior who yet intercedes for us in the most holy place above where sins are being blotted out. May we by faith be there. And may we gain the victory in the name of Jesus.